The other plane was a Spanish fellow named uh, Gordillo McGill, who built an RV-8 around 360 gallons of fuel tanks. He also had skis on it, and he he actually did the cross the entire continent of Antarctica, 7,100 miles from King George Island to New Zealand in an RV-4. So those two airplanes have done this trip. There's some turboprops that have, but there's not been a production airplane. Hello, and thank you for joining us for episode 83 of the Aviation News Talk podcast, where we bring you general aviation news and safety tips for pilots and student pilots. Today, the spirit of adventure is still alive in general aviation, because after the news, we're going to talk with John Bone about his upcoming trip to Antarctica. Plus, this week in the news, a pilot in Canada is awaiting sentencing for a sabotage act from the air that cost a power utility $22 million. And there's a new air race being planned for electric aircraft. And finally, 100 U.S. Marines are set to refurbish a runway at a rather unique airport in the United States. And we'll tell you why that's a win-win for the Marines and the airport. Welcome to Aviation News Talk, where we talk about general aviation. I'm Max Trescott. I'm here to educate and inform you and hopefully have a little fun. Along the way, I'll share my over 40 years of experience as a pilot, author of the G-1000 Glass Cockpit Handbook, and the 2008 National Flight Instructor of the Year. I specialize these days in Cirrus aircraft like the SR-20, SR-22, and SF-50 Vision Jet. So if you're interested in any aspect of these aircraft, you're thinking of buying one or you'd like some training in one, please call me now for a free consultation and possibly a free demo flight. And if you're new to the show, we typically do a weekly news show, including listener feedback and answers to questions, and occasionally we do an interview. Last week in episode 82, we talked about how to increase spacing on final without having to resort to dangerous S-turns. So if you missed that episode, you may want to check it out. All this and more, and the news starts now. From the WashingtonPost.com, in December 2014, Hydro-Quebec, Canada's largest electrical utility, was hit with a crippling blackout. Traffic lights went dark, and more than 188,000 customers lost power. Industrial users were asked to slash production, and the provincially owned utility was required to buy emergency power from neighboring utilities at an estimated cost of $22 million. The power failure resulted from an act of sabotage by Norman Dubay, a 56-year-old pilot and inventor with a grudge against the utility who used a small aircraft to hobble two massive power lines. Dubay was found guilty of three charges of criminal mischief in September. Dubay was back in court last week in St. Jerome, Quebec, for a sentencing hearing in this unusual trial, much of which was held in secret because of national security concerns. Prosecutors argued that he should be given 10 years in prison for the attack. The exact method used by Dubay to sabotage the lines, which transport electricity from hydroelectric dams in northern Quebec, is unknown because a publication ban was ordered on much of the testimony during the 27-day trial. Prosecutors sought the ban to protect national security, presumably to discourage copycats. A close reading of the judgment indicates that unidentified materials were dropped on the lines from the plane at three locations on the same day, prompting short circuits that ricocheted across the Hydro-Quebec grid. Dubay had a long-running dispute with Hydro-Quebec over the utility's efforts to access power lines that run through land he owned. The judge described the dispute in his ruling as a deep-seated grudge against the utility. Despite having only finished high school, Dubay is a successful inventor having designed a single-engine aircraft called the Aero Cruiser and built a successful general aviation business. Hydro-Quebec initially had no idea what caused the blackout, but two loggers in the area near Mirabelle Airport north of Montreal saw a small plane flying over the affected power lines when they exploded in front of their eyes. The men called the utility and the police were called in. Armed with a description of the plane, an aero cruiser designed by Dubay, the police obtained detailed radar information from NAV Canada, which runs the country's air traffic control system. Dubay's plane was identified as the culprit. Dubay is also facing separate criminal charges resulting from a series of disputes he had with municipal officials over property evaluations. In one case, a municipal employee's house was destroyed by fire, and another official was the victim of a Molotov cocktail attack. From Flying Magazine at flyingmag.com, Delaware State University orders 10 Vulcan Air V1.0 trainers. 
Now, if you're wondering, why is this a news story? I wasn't familiar with the Vulcan Air, so I went out to see how many of them are here in the United States. According to the FAA registry, there are only 14 total Vulcan Airs in the U.S., of which only one is a model V1.0. And so the fact that Delaware State University has just ordered 10 of these is a pretty significant increase in the number of Vulcan Airs in the United States. Delaware State will soon begin replacing its aging fleet of Piper PA-28 trainers with 10 new Vulcan Air single-engine V1s, according to the university. Now, just jumping to the end of the article here, the Vulcan Air is a four-seat FAA-certificated aircraft that uses a Garmin avionics package with ADS-B in and out, weather and traffic displays. It's powered by a Lycoming 180-horsepower engine with either a fixed-pitch or constant-speed prop, and the university says it's at least $100,000 cheaper than its nearest competitors. Now, the school inked a deal with Ameravia, Inc., which is the U.S. distributor, and they said deliveries are expected to begin before the end of this year and continue into 2019. Additionally, beginning in 2019 and continuing through 2027, uh, the university intends to purchase at least one additional aircraft each year for a total of up to 20 airplanes to accommodate expansion of the school's professional pilot program. The aircraft are expected to become the workhorses of the fleet, allowing students to train on the latest all-glass avionics cockpit technology. Technology. Now, here's a part of the deal that I thought was really very clever. According to uh, the university's director of aviation programs, Michael Hales, the parts logistics package, which puts spare parts in our hangar on consignment until needed, will help keep our airplanes in the air. And if I understand that correctly, that means that those parts will not be paid for by the university until they actually use them. And that's a heck of a lot better than having to order parts and wait for them to uh, come in from Italy, which is where Vulcan Air is based. They also say the choice of the G500 avionics is cost effective, but still includes everything we need, while a flight data recorder that downloads flight and engine data through the cloud should work well for our instructors, students, and maintenance staff. And we wish the university well and wish Falcon Air great success with their aircraft here in the United States. And also from Flying Magazine, an update to the DPE policy. Of course, DPE stands for Designated Pilot Examiner. So these are the folks who give you check rides around the country. And I got some information about this probably more than a month ago from our good friend Jason Blair, who's been on the show a couple of times. And I'll have to follow up with Jason later to find out if there's uh, even more to the story than this. But according to this article, the first of the changes are a result of the policies that uh, the industry hopes will help alleviate practical test backlogs in certain areas. Areas of the country. The change will allow DPEs located near FISDO boundaries, of course those would be the boundaries between FAA districts, to operate without the previous geographic restrictions to offer specialty tests such as glider or seaplane testing throughout the country and for examiners who may find themselves regularly or seasonally in other areas to provide tests without needing prior approval from local FISDO offices. The ease restrictions are expected to provide some degree of flexibility to restrictions that have slowed practical test production in the past. Some of the notices highlight, say, initial CFI practical tests can directly be scheduled with examiners who have authorization to conduct those tests and that they no longer must contact a FISDO office to have an examiner assigned. DPEs are now authorized to give up to three full practical tests and an unlimited number of retests in a day. The Flight School Association of North America Lead Industry Task Force continues to collaborate with the FAA for positive testing administrative changes that will allow practical tests to be scheduled within 14 days of being signed off by their CFI. And from AOPA.org, student loans available for Delta Airlines trainees. Delta Airlines is making it easier for employees to transition to career pilot roles by introducing student loans. Delta's Propel Pilot Career Path program was created in response to the pilot shortage, offering current employees a pathway to transition to pilot jobs. The air carrier announced in October that Wells Fargo will offer a competitive price student loans of up to $75,000 for qualified borrowers through the bank's collegiate loan program. The loans available with fixed rate and variable rate terms are also available to participants in Delta's collegiate pilot career path, and those people can borrow up to $25,000 toward flight training costs. Delta created the Propel Pilot Career Path program to make pilot careers more attractive. By the way, are there enough P's in that? <laughs> <laughs> to make it more attractive to current staff, college students, and members of various aviation organizations. The company expects to hire 8,000 pilots in the coming decade, and current Delta employees can qualify for the company pilot career path program with a private pilot certificate and at least 100 hours of log flight time. 
The airline plans to announce another pathway called Propel Advance in late 2018 for pilots who already possess commercial multi-engine CFI or ATP credentials. From aeronews.net, Lockheed Martin challenges students to create the future of flight. Lockheed has launched a new digital curriculum for high school students, parents, and educators as part of Generation Beyond. It's a free online STEM education program used in thousands of U.S. classrooms. The curriculum includes video challenges, a virtual field trip to Lockheed Martin's famous skunk works, and surprise STEM lab takeovers in select U.S. high schools. The aviation curriculum puts students in the shoes of scientists and engineers to tackle real-world technology challenges, from fighting wildfires to making flight suits for military pilots safer. Students will learn about a range of cutting-edge technology areas, apply critical thinking skills, discover the exciting work that a STEM career can offer, and hear directly from people who are doing that exciting work today. The curriculum's virtual field trip, called Think Like the Skunk Works, will premiere live from Palmdale, California on Tuesday, December 4th at 1 p.m. That's Eastern Time, and that would be 10 a.m. Pacific Time. Students will travel virtually to Lockheed Martin's famous Skunk Works, go behind the scenes, and meet some of the skunks pioneering technologies that will change the future of flight. Educators, classrooms, and communities can register for the virtual field trip at generationbeyondinschool.com. As part of the program, Lockheed Martin will also surprise select high school classrooms in multiple U.S. communities in early 2019 with STEM challenges. Lockheed Martin engineers and scientists will visit classrooms, work alongside students to complete top-secret missions, and engage them in the interesting work that STEM careers offer. Lockheed Martin has directed that $50 million be spent to fund STEM scholarships over the next five years. From electric.co, that's E-L-E-C-T-R-E-K dot C-O, Air Race E aims for world's first electric airplane racing championship in 2020. As electric aircraft get faster, Air Race E is seeking to accelerate the adoption and acceptance of electric aviation with hopefully highly entertaining high-speed all-electric airplane race. Starting in 2020, Air Race E will supplement the existing annual Air Race 1 World Cup that features the world's fastest pilot flying at speeds up to 280 miles per hour at a mere 10 meters from the ground. The organization is still in the developmental stages as airplane design is still being worked out as are partnerships in sponsorships. The Air Race E website clearly lays out the organization goals and says their mission is threefold, to offer industry partners a necessary platform to develop technology, to promote the use of cleaner power and transportation, and to deliver an exciting, intriguing, fun motorsport to audiences around the world, both live and on television. And in a related story that comes from Flyer Magazine, which is flyer.co.uk, they say an electric race plane is to be developed by Nottingham University. They say an integrated plug-and-play electric motor, battery, and power electronic system will be designed and retrofitted into an existing petrol-powered Air Race 1 plane in the workshops at Nottingham. The university is investing £13 million in the Beacons of Excellence program, which is aimed at championing field-leading responses to global challenges, including sustainable travel. Quote, this is a groundbreaking partnership between Air Race E and the University of Nottingham, which will undoubtedly have a huge impact across the electric aviation industry, said Jeff Zoltman, CEO of Air Race Events. Air Race E will see electric aircraft racing directly against each other on a tight circuit just above the ground and at speeds faster than any land-based motorsport. Formula Air Race planes, classified as experimental, are the only aircraft in the world designed specifically for racing and built to a specific race formula. Air Race E will be run to a similar format to Formula One pylon air racing, where pilots compete simultaneously to be the first to cross the finish line. Eight airplanes race directly against each other at speeds over 400 kilometers per hour around a tight circuit just 1.5 kilometers end-to-end, which would be just a little bit under a mile. And finally, from the Long Beach Press-Telegram in Southern California comes a story that the Marines will be repairing Catalina Island's airport runway as part of a training exercise. In January, about 100 Marines, part of the 1st Marine Expeditionary Force, are expected to come ashore and establish a base on top of a mountain in the island's interior. There, they will set up a camp, including places to sleep and eat, and from there will work to repair the runway at the Catalina Airport. The $5 million project is expected to take three months and will be used as a training exercise for the Marines. The project is a collaboration between the Catalina Island Conservancy and the U.S. military. It will restore the 77-year-old runway that's become cracked and decayed. Presently, there are about 7,000 flights onto Catalina Island each year. 
Quote, if we went with a private contractor, it would take 11 months, said Tony Budrovich, president and CEO of Catalina Island Conservancy, a nonprofit land trust that promotes education and recreation on the islands. The Marines will do a complete repair of the 3,000-foot-long and 60-feet-wide asphalt runway. The runway is in a remote section of the island, 11 miles from Avalon, so the project will simulate working in a foreign country during a deployment. Quote, Catalina is like an island in the Pacific because there is no rental equipment. If they don't bring it, they'll have to improvise a solution, Budrovich said. It's exactly what they deal with in an extreme location. They not only have to build the runway, but have to create buildings, set up hygiene, and cooking. According to Lieutenant Colonel Duncan Buchanan, who's part of the 1st Marine Expeditionary Force at Camp Pendleton, this project allows Marines to gain valuable experience in repairing damaged runways and increases our capabilities and readiness to tackle a range of military operations around the globe. It also ensures that the community benefits from a fully operational airport for daily provisions, as well as to aid in any potential recovery effort after natural disasters. Catalina's airport was built in 1941 by William Wrigley. It was carved out of the surrounding landscape by leveling two mountaintops and filling in the remaining canyon to create the main runway. The airport got its name from its location as one of Catalina's highest points, an elevation of 1,600 feet. Now, if you've never been into into Catalina Island, I've got to tell you, it's rather remarkable. It's got a steep drop-off, almost like a cliff as you approach the airport. So, in many ways, it's kind of like flying into an aircraft carrier. So, if you ever get a chance to go to Catalina, definitely check it out. Well, that's the news for this week. Coming up, we're going to talk about what it takes to fly a small plane to Antarctica. And a listener asks for tips for how not to overfly the missed approach point on a non-precision instrument approach. Stick around. We'll be back here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. And welcome back. In a couple minutes, we'll get to our main topic about flying to Antarctica. But first, let me give you a few quick updates. Now, here's one that went out last week about a flight that I had with a client who's working on his commercial rating. And I included this in the email that I sent out to our Patreon supporters. Often when I send out those emails, I include a little note about what I've been doing in the past week. And this particular gentleman needed the two hours of dual instruction for a night flight to an airport at least 100 nautical miles away, which is part of the commercial uh, requirements. Now, we had a really strong headwinds as we were flying about 30 knots at time. And so we were looking for a pretty good tailwind on our return, which turned out to be mostly true. Uh, Winds were from the northwest, as they often are here in California. And we landed on a runway way out in the Central Valley that was fairly deserted. It was uh, runway 31, 3,000 feet, relatively flat out there, which is nice. Surface winds, however, were just five knots, so very, very light at the surface. And so for the return, I suggested that we depart runway one, two, primarily because it would save us from having to make two turns to get back down into the downwind in what I really would describe as inky blackness. And I thought that might be just a little bit disorienting to the pilot. So I thought a straight out, which would be headed toward our destination, would be better than having to make a couple of uh, turns after takeoff. Now, we were in a Cessna 182, and on the climb out, I noticed shortly after takeoff that we were only climbing at about 150 feet per minute, which is not very much for a a Cessna 182. And we were already at a relatively slow 75 knots. Now, VY in that aircraft is 80 knots, so obviously it wasn't that we were pitched too low that we had the slow climb rate. Something else was going on. So I had to pitch up a little bit more closer to the VX speed and raise the flaps from 10 degrees to zero. And pretty quickly after that, our climb rate started to increase and I relaxed a little bit. But it was only later after we were done with the flight that I realized what must have happened. Uh, During the climb out, I noticed that we had 30 knots of tailwind at a relatively low altitude. I remember thinking that if we stayed at uh, some altitude, which I think was probably at 2000 AGL or maybe even lower, that we'd have a really swift trip home. And of course, we weren't going to stay that low because we had mountains ahead of us. But, you know, I kind of noted, boy, the wind's really uh, moving us along quickly here close to the surface. We also noted that the temperatures aloft were much warmer than expected. So 
clearly we had an inversion with cooler temperatures and calm winds at the surface and faster winds, probably just a few hundred feet AGL above the aircraft. So as we climbed out, winds were increasing from behind us, which would be a shearing tailwind. And that's the same thing you might encounter if you were uh, going into a microburst. And of course, a rapidly increasing tailwind is going to rob an aircraft of climb performance. Now, fortunately, I was looking both at the airspeed and the vertical speed as this was going on, as I always do during night takeoffs, because we've talked before about somatographic illusion during a night takeoff. Uh, as the uh, body is accelerated, you feel the uh, uh, liquids moving in your uh, inner ear, and that gives a sensation of the head pitching back, which pilots interpret as a climb. And there have been many crashes where people have uh, crashed at night soon after takeoff because they were not looking at the airspeed indicator and the vertical speed indicator. They felt like they were climbing, but they didn't look at the instruments to actually confirm that they were flying. So fortunately, I was doing that, quickly determined that we did have a bit of a climb issue. And so it's kind of interesting. We're trying to avoid one risk by doing a, uh, a downwind takeoff, but inadvertently we brought ourselves into a, a different kind of problem. Fortunately, it all worked out, but I'm going to file that one away in memory and remember that for the future. And I want to thank everyone who has already taken our annual listening survey. And this is your chance to help guide the show. If you haven't done that, please go ahead and uh, give us some feedback. If there are topics you'd like to hear about that you think are important and other pilots could benefit from hearing, let us know. Just take the survey. Just go out to aviationnewstalk.com slash survey. You'll have to type that in because I don't want folks who just randomly go to the website showing up. You'll only hear about this if you listen to the show. Again, just type in aviationnewstalk.com slash survey, and you can also find a link to it in the show notes by tapping the artwork on your smartphone's player. Well, let's talk about where I'm going to be. Yeah, I think you probably already know. I am scheduled to be on an airplane in less than 24 hours to take me to Sydney, Australia. I'll be teaching at the uh, COPA, the Cirrus Owner Pilots Association Pilot Proficiency Program, next weekend. So I'm set to fly with four different uh, individuals, uh, one of whom is uh, one of our Patreon sponsors. So that'll be fun to meet a few listeners uh, while we're down under there. If you're going to be in Australia and you've got something cool you think I'd be in, interested in doing before I leave on the 15th of November, shoot me an email. Please let me know. Just go to aviationnewstalk.com, click on contact at the top, and uh, let me know what kind of great ideas you have there. And hey, if you enjoy this show and you're looking for just a little bit more, well, head on out to our Patreon page. I post lots of things there that sometimes make it into the show, some of which don't. Here are a couple items that I've just posted here in the past week, which didn't make it into any of our shows. One is a story about using 911 to get better cellular service when you're in the air. Fascinating little thing that I didn't know. Apparently, when you dial 911, the FCC requires that all carriers uh, try and feed your call through. So if you're in the air and you have poor uh, cell coverage through your carrier, 911 might get you to a much closer tower with better coverage since all carriers are required to uh, pass through 911 calls. And it's a great story I posted about someone who dialed 911 while in the air to get an instrument clearance to fly an ILS into Helena, Montana. I think you'll really enjoy that story. And also, there is a separate story listing Garmin webinars for the month of November and December. Those are all free. If you're interested in any of those kinds of things, just go out to the Patreon page, type in aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome, then click on post, which is a tab near the top, and you can see all of the posts there. Speaking of Patreon, I'd like to thank everyone who signed up in the last week to become a supporter. Those include Larry Noe out of New York. He added his pledge up to $50 a month. Thank you very much, Larry. And also Dirk Kongeiser and Pete Shelters, who added his pledge up. And finally, Steve Snyder. Thanks so much. And hey, this is the beginning of the month. That's when I mention all of our super supporters, people who contribute more than $20 a month. They include Jeremy Zawadny, a software developer. Peter Long, who's a CFI friend down in Australia. Seth Lake, a military instructor pilot in Arkansas. You can read about his uh, flight school and his podcast at gonogo.aero. Jason Blair, who's a DPE, a pilot examiner. His blog is at jasonblair.net. Joseph Haggerty II, who's a Mooney owner and pilot. Michael Rogers, who I just heard from again this week. He's a Cirrus pilot and pilot in Southern California. Michael Spain, student pilot in Oklahoma, who told me he was interested in buying a Cirrus. 
Larry Noe, who we just talked about, he lives in the New York area, flies a Bonanza G36, and he said this week he's thinking about uh, getting something different. Carl and Ann Rossi of Maine Kooncat Aviation, they operate three Cessna T240 aircraft. Roger Griggs, he's got about 2,000 hours in a TBM 850 and currently has a new Meridian M600 that he's put about 100 hours on it. Chuck Price, a local pilot I've flown with, he's at 2simple.ai. That's the uh, smart truck company he uh, does the software for. Don Dillman, he's a professional pilot who runs a large training center for a very major air carrier. He owns an F-33A, and he just reinstated his CFI. Stella Sue, she's a student pilot in the SR-20, who I fly with locally. Jonathan Weisswasser, a vascular surgeon and also ham radio operator who flies a Meridian. Jim Barreth down in Monterey, he runs active noise control, and I'm going to be seeing him in Australia. Uh, Fabio Camlos, he's an MD, also an SR-22 owner. Lance Fletcher, former crew chief of the Air Force on the F-111F. Uh, he said he's wanted to fly for decades, and he uh, just received a book from me in the mail because of uh, his support. So, Lance, I hope you enjoy that. Joseph Morales, patent lawyer in Maryland. He's a former National Guard Black Hawk pilot. Moj Kazi, software developer here in Silicon Valley who helps out on our website. Tyson Weiss, co-founder and CEO of ForeFlight. Adam Nunn, he flies a Piper Cherokee in Texas. Chris Carnahan flies a 1955 V-tail out of St. Louis. Anthony Pitt, he's a private pilot down in Brisbane, Australia, flies a 172. Jeffrey Bell, general surgeon working on his uh, CFI. David DeCurtis, recently stepped up from an SR-22 to a Honda Jet. Edward Varso, he's in law enforcement and a member of Riverside Pilots Flying Club in SoCal. Antoine Hanacom, who I'll be flying with later this week in Australia. He's a Cirrus owner. Jack Downey, he's a new owner of a 2002 SR-22 in Boulder, Colorado. By the way, he's looking for a partner in that aircraft. And if you're interested, you can reach him at Cirrus at jackdowney.co. And finally, Paul Peterson, who is a CFI in Livermore, California. Thanks very much to all of our super supporters who give more than $20 a month to the show. And of course, thank you to everyone who contributes in any way to the show, including leaving reviews, sending questions, and all those kinds of things. Now stick around because in seven seconds, you're headed with me to Antarctica, right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. And welcome back. As you probably know, I have had a very heavy travel schedule. I've been out of town every weekend for six straight weeks now. But the benefit of that is I've run into some interesting people along the way. One of them was John Bone. John is a fellow flight instructor, and he mentioned to me kind of casually that he was headed to Antarctica. And I thought, holy cow, that's a story I want to know more about. So earlier today, I talked with John. Here's that interview. Now, before we get started, let me tell you a little bit about John Bone. Bone studied aeronautical engineering at Northrop University, which was founded by Jack Northrop of Northrop Aviation. He's an A&P mechanic. He's worked as chief pilot for major U.S. companies, and he was also a pilot for Delta Airlines until he retired in 2016. He's currently a flight instructor at Forgotten Coast Flyers, located at the Apalachicola Regional Cleve Randolph Field in Apalachicola, Florida. Well, John, I'd like to officially welcome you to the Aviation News Talk podcast. We're excited to have you here. Well, thank you, Max. I'm a real fan of yours. And uh, besides listening to your podcast, I have pretty much a dog-eared copy of your G1000 book that I keep right there on the table next to my simulator. That's great. Well, thanks for that. I didn't realize that. So the reason I want to talk with you is you've got this really major trip coming up to Antarctica, which really caught my interest. But that's not really the first long, long trip you've done. So tell us first about last year's trip. Well, last year I took my 2011 Cirrus SR-22. It's a normally aspirated uh, clean wing airplane that I've had since uh, 2011. I bought it new. And I, you know, when I flew as an airline pilot and flying corporate jets uh, internationally, I used to hear these small planes out there. And we would sometimes relay a position report and you'd see small U.S. registered airplanes in airports that you just wouldn't expect to see them. New Caledonia, uh, New Guinea, maybe out in Sri Lanka. And I just got fascinated with these guys flying these small planes all over the world. So 
when I retired from Delta, I pretty much made the commitment that I would try a, an around the world flight. So I did a, a westbound circumnavigation last year, and I flew it as a, as a member of the National Aeronautic Association, which is a very old aeronautical club in Washington, D.C. They belong to the Federation Aeronautical International, referred to as the FAI. And they're located in Lusain, Switzerland, and they keep track of air records. So I wanted to I wanted to qualify under the FAI requirements for a circumnavigation. And they have a minimum miles that you have to fly and some other requirements that aren't particularly difficult. So they issue a circumnavigation badge. It's basically a diploma looking document. And they issue one for an eastbound circumnavigation, a westbound circumnavigation, and a polar circumnavigation. Last year, I flew a westbound circumnavigation and qualified for that westbound badge. And I went out, um, I left from Apalachicola, Florida, and stopped in Texas and Arizona, and then to Merced, California. And in Merced, I had ferry tanks installed. 140 gallons of aluminum tanks installed in the cabin. We took the back seat out, put a 100-gallon tank there, and we took the co-pilot seat out, put a 40-gallon tank in the co-pilot seat. And I flew from Merced out to Maui, Hawaii, which was, of course, the longest leg out of the bunch. It's um, 2,146 miles, I think, and that took uh, 13 hours and 16 minutes. From there, I went on to uh, Majuro, which is the capital of Marshall Islands, which is another 2,000-mile flight. And uh, it was 12 and a half hours to go out there. Then I went to Guam, uh, down to Subic Bay in the Philippines. And then I crossed Vietnam, Cambodia, and landed in uh, Utapau, Thailand. And I went up to Nagpur, India, Abu Dhabi, and the United Arab Emirates. Hurghada, Egypt, went up to Rome, Italy, uh, Jerez, Spain, on the southern coast of Spain, then to Santa Maria in the Azores, and I crossed the North Atlantic there from Santa Maria to St. John's, Newfoundland. And I had a fairly short leg down to Fredericton, New Brunswick, because there was some icing conditions in Maine, and when they cleared, I went on to Norfolk, back to Apalachicola. This is about 18 legs. 20, a little over 21,000 miles. It took 53 days. And I put about 140 hours on the plane. The plane ran perfect. It ran absolutely perfect. The only squawk I had the whole trip was I'd rigged up a, a, a ham radio to use for eight, as an HF radio. And it quit on me over the Indian Ocean. Did three oil changes and not a single squawk on the airframe except for that radio or the engine. Wow, sounds like a, a fabulous trip. So 53 days, it sounds to me like you uh, took a little bit of time off and perhaps enjoyed a couple things along the way. Tell us what you did when you weren't flying. Yeah, well, some of that, sometimes uh, I would wait for weather because I pretty much flew, uh, I had. I probably didn't fly 10 hours IFR that whole trip. It was pretty much all day VFR. I had to ship fuel out to Majuro, and they, when the ship got there, they forgot to take the drums off the ship, and they went on to Guam. Yeah, they put on another ship back to Majuro, and the ship broke down. So I ended up in Majuro for a week waiting for the fuel to get there. And then when the fuel got there, I was uh, like on a Wednesday, and the guy that was helping me pump the fuel into the plane said, you know, it's too bad that you're not here this weekend because there's a marlin fishing tournament here this weekend and my brother runs this boat and you can go fishing with us. So, you know, there went another five days because I had to wait to fish the fishing tournament. In Subic Bay, I had an issue getting my clearance across Vietnam and I lost a couple of days there. But a guy at the airport took me up to uh, Mount Samat where... Uh, it's a, there's a monument there where the U.S. troops surrendered to the Japanese troops 
And then they marched them down the Bataan Death March, 61 miles into the Filipino jungle. And so I went up and hiked the Bataan Death March Trail. It's marked out and um, veterans come there every year and you can walk the whole trail. I walked about 20 miles of it. Wow, that must have been really uh, kind of inspirational, the uh, chance to, to do that. And were there any other logistical challenges you ran into along the way? I had these permits to cross Vietnam, Cambodia, and Thailand. And when I went to leave Subic Bay, I couldn't get an IFR clearance. And they said, well, you got to go at 14,000 feet. And I said, well, I can't go at 14,000 feet. I didn't have oxygen. And I said, I can go 12,000 below. And I said, well, we can't let you go across Vietnam IFR below 14,000 feet just because our communication radios won't work. And so I said, I said, how am I going to get? from Subic Bay to Thailand then. He said, well, just file VFR. So this was Ho Chi Minh Center. I said, VFR. So I just took this ICAO flight plan and marked it VFR. I went down and got a VFR, opened a VFR flight plan and flew from Subic Bay across the South China Sea, across Vietnam, across Cambodia, landed in Utapo, Thailand, and called up and canceled my VFR flight plan. <laughs> which I, I didn't know you could fly the far across those countries. <laughs> <laughs> well, that worked out well. So you've obviously visited a lot of countries before, uh, you know, in, in your uh, role as a, a jet pilot and also an airline captain. Uh, were there special considerations that you had to, to do when planning for this? And what kind of resources did you find? I mean, somehow knowing to ship gas into a particular location, that's not something every pilot would know. Well, I had flown uh, internationally with the airline, but basically my plan was to avoid any place I'd ever been before. <laughs> and uh, I also didn't want to go to big cities. You know, I usually smaller, I was looking for smaller airports, general aviation friendly international airports is, was kind of how I got started with the parameters I wanted to do. So shipping fuel is kind of interesting because you know, once you get out of the country, outside of Europe and the United States, most all fuel is in drums out there. Even jet fuel is in drums. So it's common that fuel gets shipped to these airports on fuel tankers and drums. So I just, I just requested uh, to ship three 55-gallon drums of 100 octane out to Majuro, and it wasn't a big deal. I bought them. I, Air Service Hawaii organized them for me in Honolulu and took them down the dock and put them on the ship. And they went out there like a lot of fuel does. So some places that works pretty well. Other places it's not possible to do that because there's restrictions on flammables and environmental stuff. But the route, the route that I pick, I look for small airports. I look for airports that had avgas. And the only one in there that didn't, that was an issue, was Majuro. So I just arranged to ship some fuel out there. You have to plan all this, you know, months in advance for it to work. Well, let's tell us about your next circumnavigation. Is that a polar navigation? So the FAI has a polar circumnavigation star. And it's really not a polar circumnavigation the way you would visual it where you cross both of the poles. So for this, for small planes like this, they define the polar sap circumnavigation as a flight beyond 75 degrees south, 75 degrees north, and then you're required to cross the equator between 90 and 180 degrees from where you past it going the other direction. So if you if you go southbound across the equator, when you come back north, you got to be more than 90 degrees. And that's really difficult to do in a small plane. So if you kind of picture it, it's sort of going, it's like a polar a circumnavigation where you cross through the polar areas, but don't necessarily completely circumnavigate via the poles. And so what's the original route that you had planned? And, and tell us what other kinds of small aircraft have ever done this, this kind of route. As far as I know, in terms of small planes, there's only two airplanes that have been able to do this. Both of them were experimental, and both of them were specifically built for the flight. 
So Bill, Bill Harrelson built uh, Lance Air 4 and completed this flight. He actually holds these around the world via the pole speed record in that Lance Air 4. The other plane was a Spanish fellow named uh, Gordillo McGill, who built an RV-8 around 360 gallons of fuel tanks. He also had skis on it. And he he actually did the cross the entire continent of Antarctica, 7,100 miles from King George Island to New Zealand in an RV-4. So those two airplanes have done this trip. There's some turboprops that have, but there's not been a production airplane, you know, normally certified. It's not an ex- not an experimental and not on some sort of a ferry permit that's been able to do the trip. And it doesn't look like I'm going to be able to either. <laughs> I thought I thought I pretty much had this put together. The route, there's five islands that don't have fuel. And so I've been arranging to ship fuel to all these different locations. And I found out just a couple of weeks ago that they're not going to allow me to send this fuel down to Antarctica. So I still plan to go. And I, I still hope to land down on Antarctica, but I'm not going to be able to put any additional fuel on down there to go beyond King George Island to 75 degrees south. I had planned to come down the east coast of Chile, I'm sorry, the east coast of Brazil, Argentina, and down to Punta Arenas in Chile, and then cross down to uh, the airport is Sierra Charlie Romeo Mike. It's Marsh Air Force Base on King George Island on Antarctica. It's a Chilean Air Force Base. And for about six weeks out of the year, beginning the 1st of January in the Antarctica summer, that runway thaws out, and it's um, it's gravel runway, about 4,500 feet of gravel, and you can land down there. And then I was going to come back and go up the uh, west coast of Chile, and then the problem is crossing the equator going back north. So I was going to go out across the Pacific to Robinson Crusoe Island, Easter Island, Tata Gigi on the eastern side of French Polynesia, Papeete, up to Christmas Island in Kiribati, and then over to Hilo, Hawaii, and back to California. I hope to do this someday, but it takes uh, it takes six different permits to land down on, on Antarctica, and I I just wasn't able to break through how to get this 100-octane fuel on the ship down there. So let's talk about Antarctica. I never would have guessed that one could you know, take a Cirrus or, or any aircraft as a civilian and go land on Antarctica. Uh, you know, Tell us what you're going to be able to do there and where you're going to stay there. Yeah, so as I've worked my way through the permit process, what I've ended up with is a permit that allows me to land uh, Marsh Air Base on King George Island. Land, I'm not allowed to overnight. I'm not allowed to fuel, but I can land there and turn around and go back. <laughs> and that's all I got out of it. I was, I had hoped I, my permit, I had applied to camp for three days. Um, there's the art, the Chilean Air Force has a hostel down there. They won't let me stay in that. So the permit I've got allows me to land there, get out, take some pictures, shake some hands and turn around and fly back to Punta Arenas. And King George Island is considered part of uh, Antarctica? Yes, it's in the South Shetland Islands and it's on the, uh, it's on the Antarctica Peninsula. It's about 550 miles south of Punta Arenas, Chile. So that's essentially talking about what kind of an 1100 mile uh, round trip that day? That's correct. Wow, that's going to be a long day. What are the temperatures going to be like when you get there? So in the Antarctica summer there, they they run around 30 degrees Fahrenheit is the high and the the, the lows down around uh, 15 20 degrees. So it's it's not that bad. 
Yeah, and I was just thinking the the biggest risk there is probably engine failure. Any things that you're doing to kind of make sure that people can find you quickly if you were to go down? Yeah, so you've got engine failure. You, it's windy down there as well. There's been fellows that have tried to do this in the past, and they've sat there for six weeks in Putin Reyes and couldn't get down there because the surface winds were so high. The U.S. Coast Guard actually has been very helpful in providing me with the information on what sort of survival equipment the Coast Guard fellows have when they operate down there. So I have a suit, a survival suit, that I got for the circumnavigation I did last year. And I'm going to layer up underneath it with uh, various layers of wool and fleece. And I've got some Arctic survival gear. The requirement, actually, is that you have seven days of survival equipment. You have to be able to survive seven days on the Arctic in order to get the permit to go down there. Everything has to be either new or it has to be cleaned and bagged so that you don't take some seeds or plants or anything like that can't be allowed down there. So you have to be inspected to make sure that all of your clothing and equipment and stuff has been purified. And what kind of things do you expect that you'll see when you get there? Well, I, you know, I need a clear VFR day. And I think that it's going to be a spectacular photographic opportunity because uh, in the Arctic summer, there's a lot of ice. You know, the sea is thawed out and there's a lot of ice in the water. And I'm I'm really hoping to get some spectacular video. And what do you think the total time is uh, to go down from Florida to Antarctica and come back? Yeah, I plan on at least two weeks. I'm going to take another little dog leg and fly out to uh, the Falkland Islands. It's about 450 miles from smaller port in Argentina, Port Stanley. So I'm going to go out to Port Stanley in the Falkland Islands and come back and um, go down to Punta Arenas. Basically, I just have to wait in Punta Arenas for a nice clear day to go down there and come back. Sounds pretty spectacular. So looking ahead, what other kinds of uh, trips are you thinking that are still out there that you'd still like to do someday? Well, I have the westbound circumnavigation badge you know i probably will get the eastbound circumnavigation badge someday and i'm not going to give up on this polar circumnavigation i just got to figure out how to crack through the fuel situation down there so for anybody else who's contemplating you know a trip like this a kind of a major you know uh, circumnavigation what kind of advice would you have for them it's very doable there's a real cool website called Earthrounders, earthrounders.com. And that's a good place to start. It lists all of the different types of planes, whether they were solo flight, multi-crew flight. Um, it lists all of the articles, books, DVDs that various men and women have done uh, after they've completed their around the world flight. There's all kinds of resources there for where to go to get your permits. There's sample routings on there. It's pretty much soup to nuts. And that's a good place to start as Earth Rounders. And I know for your uh, circumnavigation, you uh, let people track you on the web. Are you going to have something like that available for your trip to Antarctica? Yeah, I actually have two tracking devices. I've got a Spider Track 6 that's hardwired into the airplane um, that always transmits the position of the airplane. It's also got a SOS mode on it. And then I've got the Garmin Explorer, which is a really handy device. It also transmits your position and sends out tracking information. Also has a uh, SOS function. And you also can send and receive text messages on the Garmin Explore. It's a really handy device, and it's not particularly expensive either. And then I also have uh, an Iridium Go, which is um, essentially an Iridium sat phone, but rather it being a standalone phone that sets out a, sends out a Wi-Fi signal so that you can pair your iPhone or your iPad to that Iridium Go, and you can send and receive 
sat phone calls over your portable devices. The, all three of those are real small. The Iridium Go and the Garmin Explorer, I had a bank of USB ports put in so I could keep all that stuff charged. So if I ended up having to evacuate the plane, I could take those two devices, the Garmin Explorer and the Iridium Go with me. They actually fit, zip right into the pockets on the survival suit. Yeah, and I guess it's pretty common knowledge that anything that's not on your person, you're probably not going to have with you if you have to evacuate the plane. Yeah. So where would people go out on the web to kind of track you on this uh, adventure to Antarctica? Well, it's on uh, my website, ForgottenCoastFlyers.com. You can see the position of the plane in flight. You can send me messages over that website. Wow, that's pretty cool that people can actually communicate with you while you're on the trip. Yeah, you can, you can send a text message over to that Garmin Explorer. And I, while I was flying around, I had people sending me messages all the time. And you can send 61 characters. I mean, I have a plan. Uh, you know, that, that Explorer costs about $600. And then the subscription is 11 bucks a month. You know, it's pretty inexpensive. Well, I'm sure that keeps your company on the trip a little bit. So what about insurance? I mean, this is a pretty long trip. What, what potential exposure do you have? And are there ways to insure yourself for a trip like this? Well, that, there is. And you absolutely have to be insured because the, you, a lot of the permits that's on every single one of the permits is to have a copy of your insurance. And if folks that are considering a circumnavigation, that's a good place to start because if you're not able – to get insurance, it's not possible to get these permits. So that's actually one of the first things to do is to make sure that you can get insurance for it. And what I got was a, a basic trip insurance. It was a, an addendum to my policy. I had the route listed out on the insurance policy. And there's a little language in there that that's the planned route and that if you need to make some changes for weather, operational considerations, you can do so. And it was a, an, an add-on binder to my existing policy, and it was good for three months. And are you using some of the fuel tanks that you used for your last trip to, to help you on this trip? Oh, so that's an interesting question. I had aluminum fuel tanks in the cabin and had a special flight permit that allowed me to be over gross takeoff weight to carry that fuel. They won't let you do that to Antarctica because you know the way a ferry permit works you get a you get a permit to go from A to B to C well if you're going to go down to Antarctica and land and come back you're going from A back to A <laughs> so so I'm using uh, a 66 gallon turtle pack and it's a uh, collapsible tank made by turtle pack in Australia and the thing that's interesting about it is that tank is TSO'd. And it's designed to go right in the back seat of the Cirrus. And it attaches to the seat belt fittings, the rear seat. So I'm having installed uh, two pumps, two switches, and the necessary plumbing. And it all goes in on a 337. So as long as you're at or below gross weight, you can operate with this, with this turtle pack in your back seat without being on any sort of ferry permit. So, you know, like, for example, you could take a passenger with you. On the previous circumnavigation I flew, I would, when you're above gross weight on a ferry permit, you can't take anybody with you. I couldn't anyway because I didn't have a seat left. So what the 66-gallon tank does is it gives you the ability to put that fuel, that additional fuel in the cabin, and be legal and be able to carry a passenger. So if you carried a passenger, you couldn't fill it full of fuel. But with that tank back there, my Cirrus has pretty close to 12 hours of total endurance. So, you know, 10 hours of flight plan time, it's about 1,500, maybe 1,600 nautical miles of range in a standard airworthiness airplane. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, John, this sounds like the trip of a lifetime. I can't wait to see pictures from this. Remind everybody else again where they can go out on the web to, to see more about you and contact you. Yeah, that's ForgottenCoastFlyers.com. John, look forward to talking to you after you get back. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks, Max. Good to talk to you. 
Well, it's hard not to listen, John, without getting a little bit excited about a trip like that. I can only imagine what it would be like to land an Antarctica uh, general aviation aircraft and hang out there for a day. Great fun. Well, stick around now because we're going to be back with listener feedback, including one listener who had to comment about the SR-20 accident in Houston and had a question regarding land and hold short operations. We'll be right back. Welcome back. I'll get to the listener feedback and a listener question in just a moment. But first, I want to thank everyone who leaves reviews. I got to tell you, I'm just really humbled by the praise that listeners have left in their reviews for the show. Uh, first, it really tells me how highly many of you regard the show. And that helps inspire me to continue to try and raise the bar and make the show even better and, and live up to your high expectations. And second, I got to tell you, it really puts gas in my tank to keep working on new shows, often until oh, one or two o'clock in the morning, because I can tell from the review how much you really enjoy and benefit from the show. Now, when I do read uh, little portions of reviews on the air here, I usually just read a tiny sample uh, to save uh, some time. But please understand, I do read your full reviews and I appreciate uh, reading them. So thanks to uh, Dallas M17. He left a review on the Apple Podcast app, formerly called uh, iTunes. And he says in part that uh, he really enjoys the show uh, because I do a good job of breaking down and analyzing current events and then using my knowledge and experience to help listeners learn from others' mistakes, and he says the amount of knowledge he's learned in just the last few months uh, has been great since he started listening to the show. So thanks so much for that, Dallas. We also have some reviews here from people who are using our apps, both on iOS and Android, and I'll give you more information about those folks and their reviews next week. And here's an email from Alan, who is a pilot out of Palo Alto, California. He says, Max, thanks for highlighting the analysis of Cirrus 5-2 Golf's accident at Houston. I found it interesting that the analysis never mentioned the possibility of requesting a landing on runway 13 left or 13 right. Besides eliminating the tailwind present on runway 35, it might have also decreased the crosswind component. I realized the Houston Tower controller might have been reluctant to have an aircraft landing on a crossing runway, but with the winds gusting to near the maximum demonstrate a crosswind component of the SR-20 landing on runway 35 would have presented a significant challenge. I think tower's workload would have been significantly reduced to say nothing of the pilot's workload had 13 left or 13 right been used. Alan, I think that's a good point, uh, but there is a relatively new restriction that may have prevented the controller from doing just that. Uh, these days, a controller can still issue LASSO instructions, that stands for land and hold short, to land and hold short of an intersecting runway like the ones you mentioned. But these days, they can only do that for like aircraft. So in other words, they can clear two airliners to uh, have uh, be landing on crossing runways, or they can land two general aviation aircraft to be landing on crossing runways, but they cannot mix the two. So in this particular case, uh, the controller would have had a mix, and he wouldn't have been permitted to do a land and hold short operation with a 737 going to the other runway. Here's an email from Ted. He says, in a recent episode, you mentioned B.D. Cooper's copycat. And this, by the way, was in relation to a question I answered in episode 80 about whether or not one could stop a rogue airplane on a runway. And that was related to the Seattle uh, hijacking that occurred with a uh, employee from Horizon Air. Now, that hijacker was named Martin J. McNally, and Ted writes that here's a podcast that is with the criminal that did the job. He is out of prison now, and he gave a fantastic six-part interview. I think you'll find it interesting. And I did, by the way. I listened to the entire thing. So, Martin J. McNally served uh, 38 years in prison. He got out a few years ago. I think he's now 72. Fascinating guy to listen to. So, the podcast can be heard on Gangland Wire, and I'll put a link to that in the show notes. And finally, Francois from South Africa wrote regarding episode 82, where we talked about S-turns on final. And he said, what about orbits in the pattern? I think by that he means doing a 360. He says, recently a student pilot on second solo was requested by ATC to orbit on downwind for spacing purposes. She ended up spinning into the ground. I felt that it was wrong on the part of ATC. A student pilot is not really ready to do an orbit under high stress conditions such as a downwind. Well, Francois, I've got mixed feelings on that. Um, yeah, I think it's incredibly unfortunate uh, that somebody spun in given the, uh, that instruction. I guess I'd like to believe that any solo student I send up would be 
prepared uh, to do that successfully. But, you know, you raise an interesting point. I don't think we practice that much with the pre-solo students. Uh, so, yeah, my, uh, my my hopes there may be a little bit misplaced. I think I may just make sure in the future that I have students practice doing some 360s, uh, you know, uh, maybe a thousand feet above the ground to simulate doing that in the pattern in case ATC were to instruct them to do that. Thanks so much for that from South Africa, Francois. And now here's a listener question. Hi, Max. This is Daniel. I recently made a serious mistake in IMC using a G1000, and uh, I'd like your help on this. I was so fixated on the MDA that I neglected to notice that I flew past the missed approach point. And when I ultimately broke out, um, even though I was still above minimums, I was slightly past the airport. Um, what does the G1000 actually show uh, in terms of when you're past the missed approach point? The only thing I can think of offhand is that the suspend key becomes available, uh, but that's pretty subtle. So. What would you suggest to make sure that I'm going to monitor both the MDA and the missed approach point in the future? Thanks. So for non-instrument pilots who might be listening, the MDA is the minimum descent altitude, and that's the final altitude to be flown on a non-precision approach. And the missed approach point, or MAP, is the point on an instrument approach where you would decide to either land or go around if you didn't see the runway. And it's often, though not always, located at the runway threshold. Uh, Daniel, I have some suggestions for setting up the G1000. These also apply to the Cirrus perspective uh, so that you can more easily keep track of where you are relative to the missed approach point. But first, let me answer your question about what the G1000 shows after you've flown past the MAP. There were two somewhat obvious changes. One is the SUSP or suspend soft key that you mentioned, and that's going to be displayed at the bottom of the PFD. Also, you get a white enunciator at the top of the PFD that'll fly for a couple of seconds as you arrive at the MAP. There are also a couple more subtle changes. For example, the to from triangle on the course pointer in the HSI will have flipped from to to from. And at the top of the MFD, the name of the active leg will change. For example, you sent me some photos, and in one of those photos, it shows the active leg is PUDB to RW31, which would be runway 31. Uh, that's the active leg displayed at the top of the PFD for the first few photos. But for the last photo, uh, that leg has been changed to course 322 degrees to 1,000 feet, which is the first step in the missed approach. But most of these are fairly subtle changes that are easy to miss. So here's how I would suggest you set things up so that you can more easily identify the MAP. First, I would turn on one of the bearing pointers and set it for GPS. Uh, that way, as you cross the missed approach point, you'll see that bearing pointer turn 180 degrees to point behind you as you cross the MAP. Now, that's going to be the biggest visual change as you reach the MAP, and it's the hardest thing to miss. I also like having the active flight plan displayed on both the PFD and the MFD when I fly on approach. I like having it on the PFD because it's close to all the other instruments I'm monitoring, and it's easy to watch it count down to zero as you reach the MAP on a non-precision approach. Now, of course, for a precision approach like an ILS, where the MAP is an altitude and not a fixed location, you won't see a countdown to zero at the MAP. In fact, you'll probably see that you're still at at least 0.5 miles or higher when you reach the MAP on a precision approach. Now, unfortunately, the flight plan on the PFD doesn't show the minimum altitudes for each fix, but those are displayed on the flight plan on the MFD, which is why I usually have it turned on next to the moving map. And there's also a third place where you can watch the distance of the MAP countdown, and that's at the top of the PFD, just to the right of the name of your current leg. I find it's less useful than two flight plans as while it will count down to zero at the MAP, it then starts to count up again. So for example, if it's counted down to 0.2 miles and you're not watching it, it'll count down to zero and then start increasing. So if you look away from it for a while, you might not notice that it was 0.2 before, but now it's displaying 0.2 miles after the MAP. And that could be misleading. You might think that you're uh, still inside the MAP, but you're actually outside the MAP. Hope that helps, Daniel. Thanks for your question. And I can't end a show without telling you, hey, if you think someday you might buy a new or slightly used Cirrus, go ahead, contact me. I can help arrange a free demo flight for a new Cirrus and can certainly help you understand the many factors between buying a new Cirrus versus a slightly used one. As you know, I specialize in the Cirrus and work with pilots around the world.
And with that, let me encourage you to listen to bloopers at the end of the show. But also, if you have a question you'd like answered on a future show, you can just click on the artwork in your podcast player, and you'll find my contact information plus a link where you can record a question directly from your smartphone. Now, if you would take one moment just to tell one of your friends later today how much you enjoy the show and go ahead and show them how to subscribe to it. And if they don't know what a podcast is, tell them about our dedicated apps. Just go into the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store if they have an Android phone. Hit search, type in Aviation News Talk, three separate words, and help them download our dedicated app. And until next time, fly safely, have fun, and keep the blue side up. See you from down under. The Air Carrier announced in October that Wells Fargo were awful. <laughs> the Air Carrier announced in October that Wells Fargo will offer a competitive price student loans of up to $75,000 for prompting short circuits at Rick. Prompting short circuits at Rick. <laughs> yeah. Prompting short circuits that ricocheted across the Hydro Quebec grid. Oh.